This video is going to be the most complete Starfield beginner guide on the internet, I'll guarantee it. I've also made sure to avoid any spoilers, so no need to worry about that. By the time you finish this video, you will understand every system you need to know to enjoy Starfield without frustration. If you have questions or just want to say hi, leave a comment below. I read literally every single one. Be sure to take advantage of the timestamps below to return to sections of the video you want more information on later. Without wasting any time, let's dive straight in. So one of the first things that you're going to do is create your character. You're going to end up on a screen like this after a brief prologue. You don't get to create your character before you start the game, but very soon into it. And I'll let you discover why all of that is and how it happens. But you're going to have these presets. So when you find a preset that you want to start with, and then you can kind of shape and mold your character to your liking from there. Under body, you can go beast as you want, to as skinny as you want, to as muscular as we want, right? Lots of customization there. You can pick your gender. You can pick your walking style. I'm going to skim right through that to the stuff that you guys are likely going to have questions about because this is all subjective. So the strategy for creating your character really starts to come through with the background choice as well as the traits, which we'll touch on next. The background is really interesting the way this works. If you've played other Bethesda games, it's going to feel very familiar. Basically, each of these is going to give your character a little bit of lore, a little bit of a background that they can draw from in conversations throughout the game occasionally. And I do mean occasionally. It's not super often. I think in my first 40 hours, I remember maybe four or five times that this came came into play for a conversation I was in, right? It's not super common that the background is going to have an impact on your dialogue with other characters, right? It's pretty rare. So don't stress it too much. The thing that's most important about your background is probably going to be the starting skills that it gives you. This is effectively three skill points and you get one skill point every time you level. So this is like three levels that you get for free before starting the game. It's not super important. Like if you end up changing your mind about what kind of character you want to make, it's not the end of the world. Your character is not ruined because you picked the wrong background, right? That's just three levels. And in my first 40 hours or so, I am now almost level 30, right? So I've got 30 other skill points on top of the three I started with. These just account for 10% of my total skill points now. So in the grand scheme of things, not a big deal. And I will say that I probably would have chosen a little bit differently had I known what I know now. So let me explain some of these skills you want to have and some of them you want to have right away. For example, while others are going to be very specific to a very particular playthrough that you're doing or a build style that you're doing, but there are some that I think pretty much every player is going to want, like piloting. Everybody's going to want to fly a really cool ship, I think. Some guy is going to be totally fine living out his space fantasy in a 1990 Civic and, you know, power to him. But I think most players are going to want that really sweet ship, that big ship that can carry a lot of stuff, that can travel really far and looks good doing it, right? And in order to fly those cool ships, you need piloting. So grabbing a background with piloting is never going to be a bad decision because if you don't have your piloting and and if you don't have your piloting leveled up, you will run into ships where you either purchase them or you find them or you steal them. And the game says, too bad, you can't fly this. So you're SOL here. You don't get to use it. And you're going to realize, oh man, I need to level up piloting and I need to do it now. So better to start that sooner than later so that you run into that problem as little as possible. I'm going to dive into the skills and how they operate in a lot more depth in another section of this video. But just know that there are going to be skills like piloting that are going to be important to everybody. And then there's going to be skills like targeting control or boost pack training that are going to kind of depend on you and your play style. Other ones that I think everyone are going to like to have are going to be things like weightlifting. This is going to let you carry more. And if you play through a Bethesda game like I do, you're going to find that you're constantly running out of inventory space. You're constantly going to become encumbered. And this is going to help stave off that problem for you. So weightlifting is a nice one to have. You're going to be doing a lot of surveying. So surveying is nice to have. Are you someone that likes pickpocketing in these games? Well, then you're going to need theft. You cannot pickpocket until you unlock this skill or what about picking locks if you like to pick locks in these games if you're someone that sees a locked chest or a locked box and you need to know what's inside and leaving it behind feels bad then you're definitely going to want to pick up security right away again i'll talk about how important it is to pick up some of these sooner than later when i get to the skill section but just know skills like that are going to be really nice to have and to have early because in order to unlock the second level of those perks you need to level them up or you need to complete challenges that require them to be unlocked. So if you spend too much time participating in those activities without unlocking them, then when you finally do unlock it, you're not going to be able to level it up again as soon as you get your next level because you have to complete this challenge. For instance, for security, in order to level it up to level two and unlock better or more difficult locks, you have to unlock, let's say, five locks. And so we'll go in depth on how the skill system works when I get to the skill section of the video. But just kind of be aware that those ones
ones that I mentioned are going to be unanimously helpful because there's a lot of activities where if there's a skill that makes you better at that activity, a lot of times you can't participate in that activity until you have the skill in the first place, like picking locks or picking pockets, things like that, or being able to pilot better planes, right? You can't do it if you don't have the skill unlocked. So that makes those kind of supremely important choices to get sooner than later. Now for the trait section, the trait section is kind of self-explanatory. There's not a lot for me to add here other than if you hover over each one, it's going to tell you what it is. So if we hover over this one, it tells us you volunteered for a controversial experiment that combines alien and human DNA. As a result, you start with increased health and oxygen, but healing and food items aren't as effective. So you can choose three of these. The one thing to know is that some of them tell you that you can't pick another one. And when you can't pick another one, it'll put an X over it. That's what that X means. It says you can't pick this because you picked this. Now, if I get rid of that, I could pick this, but now it says now you can't pick this no matter what. That's what the X means. You can't pick it. Check mark means you did pick it. And there's some that are going to be like this one here, raise universal. And it's going to say can't combine with any other religion trade, right? So there's some that are religion exclusive. There are some that are action exclusive. There are some that are extrovert, introvert exclusive, right? Just kind of read the descriptions, pick what sounds fun to you. I wouldn't say that there's a right or a wrong answer in here. It really kind of just depends on what you're looking to get out of it. So I went ahead here and picked three random ones. Don't pay any attention to what I chose. There's no strategy behind that. Again, this is really up to you. So now we can finish. We'll pick our name and then it lets you pick your pronoun. And then you say confirm. Now, once your character has been created, you'll have a UI that looks something like this. On the bottom left there, you can see some really important information, your oxygen levels, your CO2 levels, as well as any status effects that your character has on you. So the O2 level is the white half circle. And if I start sprinting, we start using our O2. Now, if you keep on sprinting, you're eventually going to start building up CO2. And it's actually okay if you start building up CO2, it's not a big deal. That gauge is just gonna start filling up and once it hits completely full it's going to stop you from sprinting anymore boom there my character just got tired right and now i can't really sprint anymore i'm kind of stuck in this slow state until i get some oxygen back and now i can start sprinting again and until i run out of oxygen the co2 gauge is going to keep going down the oxygen levels and the co2 levels are really going to be a problem for you hoarders out there are you a hoarder are the people that can't resist leaving anything behind this is where that system really comes into play when you become encumbered i would say the biggest downside of becoming encumbered is that it eats away your oxygen levels. Normally you can kind of jog and it's not gonna use any oxygen. However, if you're over encumbered, this is going to use oxygen. So the only speed you can move at without consuming all your oxygen is this right here when you're over encumbered, especially when you're trying to cover a massive cave system or run across a planet, right? So it's going to be the encumbrance system that's really gonna make the oxygen level system really important for you. I'll dive deep into the whole encumbrance system in its own section here, but just kind of understand that's what that section of your UI is for. It's telling you about your oxygen levels, your CO2 levels. And there's really not a big deal if you start seeing the red CO2 building up. It just means that eventually you're not going to be able to sprint anymore. It's not too big a deal. Now, around the compass, you can see points of interest that you have discovered. One of the easiest ways to find points of interest is to open up your scanner by pressing F on PC or whatever you've assigned the button to on console. You can see points of interest here. It's going to basically unlock them on your compass as you kind of rotate around. And it might say that it's unknown like this one says unknown so if i tell it to scan down there in the bottom left you see it says scan and it says on pc that button's e so you'd press it and it says hey this is a structure so you can kind of use the scanner to find new locations to go and look for in the center bottom of the watch it says jemison that's the body that we are on this planet and then towards the top of the watch it's going to tell us things like status effects like whether we're poisoned whether we're bleeding or if there's a significant weather issue that we should be aware of so that's what that little red drop is right there and we open up our menu we can see statuses right here and we can see it says warning incoming hazardous weather seek shelter immediately i will say that throughout the entire game so far my first 40 hours i have basically ignored the weather system it has sometimes resulted in me taking a little bit of damage it sometimes resulted in me maybe running out of oxygen faster but i haven't ever found really a situation where the weather was so bad yet that i couldn't hang out on the planet for at least long enough to get what i wanted to get done there it wasn't like I walked out into bad weather and then my character just fell over and died. So far, it's been very slow and very gradual. But as a general rule of thumb, you don't need to stress it very much. Now, if we're to bring out our scanner, we can see some new information down there. We can see the temperature, 21 degrees, the O2, 21%, as well as the gravity. So if you're curious, like, oh, am I going to be able to jump really high or not at all? Or what's the O2? Is it breathable? And what are the temperatures like here? You can kind of pull this up and take a glance and see. Sometimes you'll pull this up and it'll say negative 290 and you're like, oh, 
yeah, dude, I'm about to get frostbite. I'm about to have a condition set upon my character that's not going to be super fun to deal with. What about his horrible green head? It's a skin condition. So pulling out your scanner when you get on any new planet for the first time is never a bad idea if you didn't already scan it before dropping down onto the planet. And we'll talk about how to do that once we get into the spaceship section of the game. On the bottom right side of the screen, we've got some more important information. The little white bar down there is going to be your health bar. You can see that I've got about 75% of my health there. And just below that, you've got your rounds of ammo, right? So you've got six bullets before you have to reload. And then you've got 49 more bullets before you're completely out of ammo. And then below that, you've got your grenade of choice that you've been using. This character has 12 of those grenades, as well as a ton of other ones. Before we continue the video, if you're enjoying the content, be sure to like and subscribe for more Starfield content. I've got a ton more of this coming your guys' way. Now let's get back to it. Now let's talk about the UI that opens up when you open your menu. So this is a place that's going to cause a lot of confusion the first time you open it. There's a ton of information here once you understand what you're looking at. So let's talk about what it is. We'll start at the top left here and kind of go clockwise, okay? So Jemison, New Atlantis, this is telling us where we're at down here below it says surveyed 33 percent so the way you survey a planet is you run around with your scanner and you literally run up to things and you scan them you can scan and mine minerals you can scan and collect plants you can scan and kill animals right or alien animals all of these things are going to help you survey the planet and kind of fill that meter up to 100 and below that you can see what time it is in case you ever have a mission there will be missions where they say hey people go out to get drinks at about 5 p.m that's when they leave the office and they go out for drinks 5 p.m. So you're going to look at this and wait for it to be 5 p.m. So you can do your mission. So you can just go to a bed and sleep or go to a chair and wait. There is a difference between sleeping and waiting. If you wait, it does not heal your character. If you sleep, it does heal your character to full health. So an easy way for me to go from 70% health to full health would be to find a bed and sleep on it. There's a lot of beds in the game you can sleep on. And if the bed is owned by somebody else, you won't be able to sleep on it. So kind of just be aware of those limitations. Now, if you click on this, it's going to tell you some more information about the planet you're on here you can see a map of all the places that you have discovered when you're spinning and turning around like for instance this one down here is unknown so i could run and point my scanner at that and it would say oh this is some geological place or this is a cave or it's a structure right it kind of tells you what it is before you run all the way over there you still have to go there to find out what's inside why it's significant and all that good stuff but you get a little bit of a hint and basically that's what you glean from this here as well as what type it is gravity temperature a little more information about the planet as well as what resources are available on the planet and what traits it has. These traits are unknown to me. We have not discovered that yet on this planet. And then we come over here. This is our skill section. And what you can tell here is how many unspent skill points we have to certification. We're 93% done with this certification, Astrodynamics. Now, that means that in order to level it up again, we have to do this challenge. It says make 15 grab jumps. So I've done 14 out of 15. And when I do that 15th one, I would be able to unlock the next level of the skill. So each rank of the skill gives gives you new kind of perks for it. So rank one of this one increases the range of our jump drives. Rank two reduces the fuel cost of the jump drives. Rank three increases grab jump range and reduces fuel costs of jump drives, right? And then four reduces fuel costs of jump drives by 50%. Just making it easier for us to get around the galaxy to some more far off places that are kind of harder to reach and to do so with perhaps maybe not as quite a powerful as a ship. So right now we have two ranks and in order to get this third one, it says we will have to make 15 grab jumps. Right. And then I'd be able to get this one. And if you hover over this one, it tells you as much. It says complete the previous ranks challenge to unlock this. And that's basically how these skill trees work here. Each one of these is a skill tree, kind of self-contained. Let's look at this one here because I haven't really put much in the way of social. I grabbed theft so that I could pickpocket things from people. In order to get anything on the next line, it says there at the bottom, locked. Spend three more points in social to unlock advanced social skills. And then same with the next one. Spend seven points in social to unlock expert. And the next line, 11 more points to unlock master. So in order to get to each row, you have to have spent a certain number of points somewhere in the tree above it. Each one of these has four levels to it. Each level makes the perk stronger or adds entirely new perks. It kind of depends on the skill and how they chose to make it operate. The skills that I find super valuable to have are going to be security. This is going to let you lockpick everything, which is a blessing and a curse because there are so many objects to lockpick in this game. I mean, there are doors, there are boxes, there are crates, there are so, so many. If you don't have this, you're going to be constantly wincing and going, man, I wonder what's behind there. I wonder what's in there. I wonder what's behind there. And most of the time, to be fair, it's nothing terribly significant, but occasionally it's pretty cool or there's some nice 
reward in there or there's a cool weapon. Occasionally it is worth it. Those moments where there's something really awesome in there tend to make it feel like it was all worth it. And this is one that you would want to grab early on because each time you level it up, it's going to let you hack higher level difficulty things. It's also going to make hacking easier because it's going to basically let you skip parts of the hacking process. I'm going to do an entire section in this video on lock picking in this game because it's a significant part of the game. It's kind of complex. Like once you understand it, you get it, but there's a lot of nuances to it that can really make it easier for you. So we'll have a whole section of this video dedicated to that. I won't dive into it too deep here, but security is one that I think everybody's going to want, or at least anybody that's going to want to know what's behind the doors and what's in the boxes. What's in the box? Piloting is one that everyone's going to want. If you want to be able to fly the cool ships, if you want to build the cool ships, you're going to want piloting. And if you don't get piloting and if you don't level it up right away, the main mistake I made on my first playthrough is I didn't grab piloting early enough. So I killed a lot of ships and now I can't level it. I have a ship that I can't use because I can't level piloting because I need to destroy more ships in order to level piloting. But I killed a ton of ships before I had piloting, which means those would have been counting towards that progress. I've got five out of 15 done. So same with log picking. I would grab these early and then every time you can level them up, do because it's going to start another challenge. It's going to require you to do a ton more lock picks or a ton more a ship kills. If you haven't unlocked the next rank, you're going to be doing those things without pushing that next challenge along. So definitely kind of stay on top of those two. That's my piece of advice. Anyway, booster pack training was really nice because it just feels good to be able to jump up to higher ledges or get around or whatever. It's just fun, but it's not as necessary as say these two are almost critical for just about any player to have. In my opinion, the scanner being able to survey is going to be nice to have. Targeting control systems is going to be one that you want, because if you want to be able to take out ships and board them, you're going to need this one. Definitely grab that one. If dealing other people's ships is one of the things that you're going to want to be doing out in space, which is pretty fun. It's a good way to get a good ship or at least make a bit of coin. The science section is going to be about are you going to be doing a lot of researching and developing of your own mods, of your own materials? Are you going to be crafting a lot? Are you going to be using whatever you find? If you're going to be crafting a lot, if that appeals to you, this section is going to be big. You're going to want to do these things depending on what you want to craft, right? If you want to get into botany, you're going to have to put points into that. And I guess the main thing to understand about this is a lot of times if you don't put points into something, you either can't do it or what you're able to do with it is very limited. So outpost engineering, for example, if you want to put outposts on planets so that they can generate resources for you, then you're going to want to put points into outpost engineering so that you can actually put outposts on more of the planets because a lot of them are going to be too hostile of environments for you to put outposts on otherwise. The game will just say, oh, you are not qualified to put an outpost here because the environment is too hostile. The environment's not friendly enough. So you're going to have to put points into this so you can put your outposts there. Okay, so the next section is the combat section. This is going to make you more proficient with weapons. Basically, laser weapons do 10% more damage, 20% more damage, 30% more damage. Laser weapons have a 5% chance to set a target on fire, right? So these are basically going to just make you better with those weapons. And here you go. Particle beams do 10% more damage, 20%, right? I haven't put a lot of points in this yet because one, the combat hasn't been the most difficult part of the game. Like for me personally, I'd rather take an extra shot or two to kill something than to have to leave a chest or a ship behind, right? Those I've just been kind of prioritizing the things that you have to have in order to be able to do it, as opposed to making it a little bit easier to kill an enemy that I'm fighting because there are some challenging fights, but for the most part, nothing's been too difficult because I've been so thorough finding weapons and finding stuff. I've already got a few legendary weapons that absolutely delete enemies. I've got really cool stuff that is making these maybe perhaps even overkill for my playthrough right now because I didn't pick like super hard difficulty, right? I just went with your standard difficulty playthrough. All that being said, these would be a lot of fun to have. Deleting your enemies is always a good time. And then next, you've got social. Commerce is going to make it so that you can more effectively sell and buy things. Astronomy here is going to make it so that you can craft specialty food and drinks. This is kind of up to you if you want to delve into this, if you want to do a more social playthrough. I really like the idea of stealing and pickpocketing from people or at least knowing what they have in their pockets. So I went for theft here. Very subjective. What you like to do. I think one good way to kind of approach each of these skill trees is to look at the bottom row and see if there's something down there that you're definitely going to want, right? There's only three in each one. Maybe read each of those bottom ones, kind of look at it, what they have and be like, is this a tree I want to put a lot of points in? Because I think that last line of perks is really cool. And if so, maybe consider dumping your spare points somewhere in that tree as you're going so that you can eventually unlock those things that you think are really cool. But oftentimes the most important ones are right there at the top row. So you can just grab them and start leveling them up right away like your pilot 
auditing like your security surveying and thefts and in my case here weightlifting which is going to let you carry more stuff before you're encumbered i have this maxed out and no regrets no regrets Mm -hmm. I'm still encumbered. Every time I leave my ship, by the time I get back, I'm carrying everything that I was allowed to carry and more. This has resulted in me making a lot of money and being able to do some pretty cool stuff to my ship. So definitely one to consider. The fitness has been nice too, because you know, it's going to give you extra oxygen and this fourth level of it, especially sprinting and power attacks. Now use significantly less oxygen. This would be really nice to have again, because I spend so much time fighting my oxygen meter when I am encumbered and I am encumbered often, right? So there's a little bit of a challenge at play there with those two things because I have a hard time leaving those things behind. And then in the bottom left here, it tells you how many skill points you have to spend. You get one skill point every time you level. So you'll get these pretty fast. I am 40 hours into the game or so, and I've got 30 skill points. It's not been a speed run. I've been really, you know, like I said, thorough. I've been unlocking every lock pick. I've been opening every container, you know, playing these games the way I always play a Bethesda game. So I'm sure that you could get more levels in less time if you were focused on things that give tons of XP like the main story quest or like various quick side quests and things like that or just killing lots of enemies. These things will generate way more XP for you than say, you know, spending a lot of time on master lock picks like I do. All right, before we continue, guys, I'm going to give a shout out to my editor and my better half. She put a ton of work into this video and she's also released a new song on Spotify under the name Desh Please. The link to it is down in the description below. Be sure to check it out. It's featuring Ryan King. It's a great song. It's called Torn Apart. If it's a song you like or something you think your partner might like, be sure to like the song, share it, and add it to a playlist. You can follow Dash Please on Spotify or on YouTube. Thank you so much for this moment of your time. And if you decide to check that song out, she greatly appreciates it. Now let's get back to Starfield. Now, if we come back to this screen, we'll keep going clockwise around this meter here. Right here, you can see our health and our status. And if we click on status, we can glean some more information. This is where you can see your actual health pool. If you're ever curious, how much health do I have? Because you'll pick up items and they say, this gives you four health. This gives you two health. And you're like, okay, is that good? Is that significant? And the answer is no. <laughs> no, it's not very significant. I've got 815 health. And I find a lot of items that give two health, one health, four health. Might have even found a meal that was 20 health, right? Unless you get into cooking your own meals. The stuff you find to eat is going to give you very little little health. It's not a very significant source of healing, but you know, in desperate times, it can come in pretty clutch. So you can see your actual health pool here. I think this is the only place you can see your actual health pool. You can see your level. I am 29. I need 25,000, 25 points of experience to level. I have 2374. So if you're ever curious exactly how far you are from leveling or how many points it takes to level, because you'll be playing through the game and you'll open a chest and it'll say 20 XP. You'll discover a new area and it'll say 40 XP, or you'll kill a mob and it'll say 60 XP. How much is that relative to what you need? Well, you can check that right here on this screen. You can see things like your status effects. So again, it's telling us that that one symbol right there meant that there was incoming weather. Again, I've never really paid attention to the weather in this game. If it's in the next 40 hours, it's going to get a lot more significant or it's going to mean a lot more. But so far, it's just been a really minor inconvenience. I run out of breath faster or I get hypothermia, which eventually all wears off on its own when I leave the planet. Anyway, my character will recover from it. It's just going to be slightly impeded in some way for a little while while I'm there. You can check on your character. This is going to tell you your resistances. Like, so right now my character has 200 physical resistance, 50 thermal, 35 corrosive, 45 air bones, 70 radiation, right? And we'll get into how you get all of these things in a moment here when we go over our gear, but that's what that is. And it tells you your background and the traits that you chose. And these are the things I chose really not knowing what I know now. So fortunately for you, you're going to make a better character than I did, because I think I would have definitely chose some things differently. Knowing what I know now, I definitely would have chose my skills in a different order because it definitely came back to bite me in the butt at some points. Um, here we can see general. You can see I have discovered 127 locations, 95 explored, 30 day days passed, five hours slept, two hours waited, and I've found 506,000 credits. If you're wondering what's the pace at which you gain credits in this game, well, you know, being a hoarder that I am, I have been picking up pretty much everything and selling everything that I could, although I've slowed down on that a lot because what I find is I'll collect more things than the vendors can buy from me. They only have 5,000 credits on hand, so I go to them with like 20,000 credits worth of stuff to sell and they take a quarter of it from me and I'm like, well, crap, I'm still over encumbered, right? Which is where a ship is really going to come into play because it's going to give you some place to store lots of stuff. So we'll talk about that when we get to ship building. Exploration ship. I've done 47 grab jumps, right? Suffice to say, you can see all your stats here, what you've done, what you haven't done. Then we've 
we've got inventory. So what are we looking at here? It's telling us our mass, which is basically the 233 is what we're carrying. And the 235 is how much we're able to carry before we're over encumbered. And we can keep carrying more and more and more and more stuff. So this could be 600 out of 235. And all that would be doing is draining our oxygen faster when we move, which is annoying but it's not the end of the world. It's also going to prevent you from fast traveling. So if I'm at 236 out of 235, I won't be able to fast travel back to my ship when I've run way out into some cave system somewhere or run way out to some abandoned science facility, right? And I want to get back to my ship. And now every time I move, it eats all my oxygen and it won't let me fast travel back, right? That's where over encumbrance kind of becomes a pain. Very similar to previous Bethesda titles and the way it works a little bit with the addition of this oxygen system. If we click on this here, we can see our inventory. Okay, so the inventory is a little bit confusing. There's a lot going on here. So let's dive into it one at a time. The first section is our weapons. So you'll find weapons as you play through the game. There's different tiers of quality. Uh, you've got your white weapons. These are just general common things. And then you've got blue and then purple. And then of course, like your gold legendary items. You'll find these in your playthrough. You'll get them as rewards from quests or you'll open up lock boxes or you'll kill enemies. I have found legendary items doing all three of those things. Quests, kills and lock boxes, right? So they're all over the place. They're not terribly uncommon. Common, you'll get them, but that's your weapons. The important thing to know about the weapon screen is down here. It says that you can compare to equip in skip inspect. You can sort sorting is going to be really useful when you're trying to decide what to sell or what to store because you can sort by damage. So maybe you want to make sure you keep things that are doing good damage and you get rid of the things that aren't. Although big piece of warning here, do not get rid of your cutter. Never, ever, ever get rid of your cutter. It's easy to do. I did it on accident once and I had to waste a bunch of time looking for a new cutter and I eventually found an NPC that would sell me a cutter. But man, it really held me up on a quest that I was doing because it needed me to go use this cutter to grind up some resources. So your cutter is what you extract mineral deposits like iron or aluminum, right? You need this cutter and without it, you can't do that. And it looks like a generic white item, but man, is it so much more important than that? So make sure you hold on to your cutter. Don't sell your cutter. Don't sell your cutter. Okay, guys. Uh, but everything else, if it's like white and it's low quality, sell that bad boy, right? It's not doing any damage. Three damage. What a joke, right? Get rid of it. So you can sort by damage so you can see what's not great. You can sort by the value so you can see, oh man, I really want to sell this item that sells for a lot. You sort by weight, you know, see if something's like super heavy and you're having weight problems and you're like, oh man, maybe I could just drop a few things and then my weight problems are solved. You can favorite things. Now this is really important. So you see the heart. That heart means I favorited that item, which means that it's going to appear on my quick slot wheel here. So if I press Q on PC or whatever that button is going to be on Xbox, right? You're going to be able to press that and it's going to open up this wheel that you can bind each of these slots to. So I could press one and pull this weapon, two, three, four, or I could just press Q and I can click on one of these. It does not pause time while this is open, but it greatly slows time while this is open. So don't use this as a pause screen and walk away from the computer in the middle of a battle because, you know, the enemies are still moving, albeit very slowly. So if you're wondering how you get things onto this wheel, it's by favoriting them. So we'll do that real quick. We'll come in here and we'll go to a weapon and let's just say this one I press B and then I can choose which slot I want it to be on I'll put it here there we go now that one I can use that on the fly in battle without coming all the way into this menu screen you can drop items from here it tells you which button to press right there and then if you ever want to go back a screen in this menu anywhere in this menu right because it's kind of a menu with lots and lots of layers you can always press whatever your back button is it's tab on PC so if I press that once it goes back one screen if I'm multiple layers in and I hold tab it takes me all the way out which is going to be really nice to know because sometimes you end up way deep in your menu system. And so you'd have to press tab like four times to get out and that can be a pain in the butt. Next, we have our space suit. This is like your full body armor and each space suit, you can see all the stats that they have available to them right here. Physical resistance, energy resistance, thermal, corrosive, airborne radiation. And then it tells you how much the suit weighs, what it's worth. I will say this value right here is not what it's actually worth, generally speaking. So if we try to sell that space suit, it sells for 567. I'm not positive how this math works just yet. Just be aware that when you're looking at an item and it tells you the value, it's never worth as much as it says it is. That value is what you would probably have to pay for it if an NPC was selling it. But whenever you buy things from NPCs, they're more expensive than when you sell them to them. You know, it's kind of got that whole thing going on. So this one here, it sells for 10K. But if we talk to this machine right here, it sells for 1,000. A little more than 10% of 
the listed value. You're carrying a few items and you're like, dang, I'm about to make 100K. No, sorry, you might make maybe 10% of that. You're gonna find lots of spacesuits in the game. You'll find them on enemies and boxes all over the place. You'll get them from quests. There's gonna be tons and tons and tons of really worthless spacesuits. This one's legendary, which means, you know, it's got extra stats down here, three extra stats, which is really nice. It can do some pretty cool stuff. Really nice spacesuit. Then you've got your jetpack. Jetpack, again, it's going to have all your same resistances, essentially. You can kind of stack any resistance. Now, one of the ways you could do this is you could save all this gear that's got really high thermal resistance when you're going to go to a planet that has really bad thermal temperatures. It's either really hot or really cold. And you could save all this gear. First, when I was playing, I was doing that. I was saving a set of gear that had tons of thermal. And then I was like, oh, this has lots of corrosive. I'll save. And you know what I found is that, dude, this stuff all weighs a ton. I don't have room to carry it on me. My ship is filling up. I don't have room to carry it on my ship. And so for the first 40 hours, at least I abandoned that and I haven't regretted it at all. I have never felt like, dang, if only I had a suit with thermal and a helmet with thermal and a jetpack with thermal to put on right now, that would be a lot of work. It would weigh a lot of weight and it would slow me down way more than it helped me. So the most compelling stats on this gear for me has been like the damage reduction at the top and the stats on the gear. So like this one has sturdy incoming damage is reduced radiation, right? These these stats down here have been kind of like the deciding factor for me on if I'm going to wear a piece of armor or not. It's been mostly down here and a little bit up here. Next, we've got helmets. Same thing, right? You've got all the same stats. Then you've got your apparel. You've got all these different outfits that you can wear. I haven't really needed or used these. I think there was one quest that required me to put this on, but for the most part, I don't really pay much attention to this. I just kind of put it on, you know, hey, it's extra stats to have on. That's nice. I haven't paid too much attention to this and so far that that hasn't really affected my gameplay in any way, shape or form outside of the quest where it's like you need to be wearing this outfit in order to, you know, pretend you're an employee here or whatever you're doing at that quest, right? Next, you've got your grenades or your throwables and there's tons of different types of throwables. Right now, I have favorited my frag grenades because I always seem to have a ton of those and I've been using them and they work exactly like you would expect them to. And there's all kinds of different types that you'll find. Then you've got ammo. The nice thing about ammo is that it doesn't weigh anything. So you'll see here the mass, no weight. So if you see ammo, pick it up. You'll never regret it. There's no downside to always picking up ammo. Unlike everything else in this game, there is always that value to weight ratio that you have to keep in mind when you're picking things up out in the wild. Ammo, not true. You can pick it all up anytime, right? So definitely do that. You're going to go through the ammo fast and there's a lot of different ammo types. So you might find yourself rotating between a few different weapons just to keep yourself from running out of ammo entirely. So, you know, maybe make sure that your favorite weapons are kind of cycling between multiple different ammo types rather than all of them using the same ammo because then you might find yourself running out pretty often. Uh, next, you have your aid items. These are items that you can find or you can make. This one here, 35% movement speed for two minutes, plus double your jump height for two minutes, which is kind of ridiculous and hilarious at the same time. Antibiotics, you're going to get infections, certain biomes that you like. If you're swimming in dirty water on some planet, you might get infected and then you could use this to treat that infection. The main thing, the big thing in here, your lifeline is going to be your med packs. Restores 3% of your health for 10 seconds. These these med packs are great. You're always going to want these on your hot wheel somewhere so that you can quickly use them. These are going to be your primary form of healing. Like it says there, 3% of your health for 10 seconds. So that's 30% of your health from one of these. Whereas a food that you eat will give you 10 health out of 800. The food that you eat gives you next to nothing. These things give you 30% of your full health bar, right? Or in that case, this would give me 30% would be what? Almost 300 health as opposed to the food that gives between one and 12 usually sometimes as many as 20, I think. And there's probably meals you can cook later on that can give you even more. While we're here looking at the inventory, one thing to be aware of, if you've seen this red arrow here, that means that I stole this item. Stolen items don't have any downside at all, right? If you have a stolen item, that's okay. If it's red, it's okay. You can teleport to other systems. No problem. There's no downside. You're not going to get flagged. Nobody's going to notice that you have red items on you unless you get caught for some other crime. Then when they confiscate the stolen materials for that, that crime. They'll also grab all of your other stolen materials on you, everything with red on it. And the easiest way to get caught with stolen materials is if you have these illegal items, like if you find an item like this and instead of a red arrow, it's gold. That means that will show up when you're grab jumping from one planet system to the next. As soon as you get into a new system, the first thing the security for that system does is scan
and your ship. And if you have any items that have a gold arrow on them, there is a very good chance that they'll find it unless you've built your ship to hide that item. And most people won't have done that, especially anywhere near the early game. So generally speaking, you don't want to pick up any items that have a gold arrow on them until you have a way to dispose of those items or a way to sell those items until you find the people that can buy them from you until you unlock those regions of this world. One way to get around that is to pick a place that you don't get scanned when you're going to and just drop the items off there until you find a person and a place that will buy them all from you without you getting scanned. I dropped all of my harvested organs on some random moon until I found a place that was willing to buy those kinds of things from me because normal vendors will not buy the gold down arrow items. Those have to be purchased by people that specifically deal in that kind of trade. Notes also generally don't really take up any weight unless it's like a book you found. When you pick up a book, you automatically open it up, you read it, and then you also throw it into your inventory. When you pick it up and read it, I have had books unlock locations in the world. I won't do any spoilers. So I found a book and it told me to go to a place. So from that moment on, I was like, well, now I have to read every single book I find. <laughs> And so I do, I open them up at least. Whenever you find these devices, these are really cool. There's a lot of things that these can do. These devices will oftentimes have lore. So you'll find one as you're scouring some abandoned science facility and you'll find one of these and loot it and it'll automatically start playing this tape that tells you the lore of that science facility. What happened? Why is everybody dead? Or why are they all gone? And man, there are some really great stories to listen to. It's one of my favorite parts of this game is the stories about how Earth ended up the way it did, how we escaped it, how we got the technology to leave it right. This sequence of stories, oh man, I was enthralled as I was looting everything and listened to these tapes that I was finding as I was looting. Really, really cool idea, really cool system. Love this. So one, they'll give you lore. Two, they'll start quests sometimes. So you'll find one, there'll be some information that starts a quest for you. Whenever you see one of these, loot it every single time. These have zero weight, so you can carry them around for as long as you want. There's no downside to it. So don't worry if you start collecting it ton of them. These have zero weight. Just remember the books though. They do have weight, right? Mass 0.5. So you're going to want to sell those books. I don't think there's any reason to hold on to them after you found them. I haven't found one yet anyway. Next, you have your resources. This is like aluminum, a drilling rig. If it's a crafting resource of any type, it's going to come into this tab. And this is probably going to, if you're someone that enjoys mining or drilling or gathering, this is going to be a place where it's really hard on your mass and it's going to send you into an over encumbered state pretty often. This this is where that problem is going to come from. If you're an enjoyer of collecting things, the easiest way to deal with that is one, you have storage in your ship. You can store things in your ship and your ship will fill up really fast, but you can add more cargo space by going into the ship building system or buying a ship with more storage space. We'll get all into that in this ship section of this video. Don't worry. There's another thing you can do in the lodge. You'll get a bedroom and in your bedroom, you'll have a safe. And as far as I know, you can put infinite amounts of material in there. However, the downside is I don't think when you're crafting, it draws from that safe. So you're going to have to remember that you put a bunch of stuff in there. So if you ever have stuff, but you have nowhere to put it as a last resort, you can go to your bedroom, store everything in your safe there. I know that crafting will pull from your ship and you can also sell from your ship's cargo. So if you can, it's better to have items on your ship and in your cargo. But if you put it in your bedroom and you're on another planet and you want to set up an outpost, well, you can't use all those materials that you put in your bedroom safe. Whereas you can build an outpost with items that are on your ship. Again, here you can see this item. I stole it from somebody. Oops, right? Uh, no big deal. Nobody cares. But if you end up with tons and tons of stolen materials on you or your ship, this is the downside of having these red items on you or having a lot of them on you at any moment, you or your ship. One time I was playing, somehow it had been 30 minutes, 40 minutes since my last save and I had done a lot of stuff and then I accidentally committed a crime and they're like, okay, we're going to take your stolen item. And I was like, no problem. The list of things that he confiscated from me starts going up on the screen. It's just the scrolling list. And I realized I had a ton of stolen stuff, like a ton of stolen stuff, like really valuable. He was taking a lot from me because of this one tiny mistake where I grabbed like a coffee cup off a table on accident in front of somebody. And they were like, hey, and then they reported me to security, right? So be careful having too many red items on you. You might want to consider storing these somewhere else, or you might want to consider using them or otherwise making sure that they aren't confiscated. I'll go over what happens when you get caught stealing and all this stuff in the thieving section of the video. If you do accidentally commit a crime and it's not convenient to load your last save. And while we're on that topic, save often, save often, manual save, quick save, memorize your quick save button and hit it often. You won't regret it. It's real easy to do something that you didn't 
intend to do in this game, whether it's pick up an object that is considered stolen. Sometimes that will leave you with the option to either kill everybody in the building that you're trying to help or let them kill you and go to your last save. So if your last save was a long time ago, that sucks. So save often, save, save, save. Then here under miscellaneous, miscellaneous. It's mostly junk, but only mostly junk. I feel like this game really benefit and mods will probably do it if Bethesda doesn't, but it could really benefit from a separate tab called junk or a separate tab items that are useful for nothing but selling, right? We really need one of those tabs in this game. And right now it's not there. This tab is almost that right? Except for the fact that it's got things like artifacts in here, which are really important. It's got things like digipix. When I first started playing the game, I saw this one full of plates, coffee cups, and I was like, oh, this is the junk tab. So I opened it up and I just sold everything in it. And then the next thing I knew when I was out and I found a chest that I needed to lockpick, I had no more digipix. And I was like, what happened to all my digipix? Well, your digipix, these are your lockpicks. They were in this category. So when I went and sold it all, I lost all my digipix, right? So I feel like the game, probably throws too many things into miscellaneous. So you have to be real careful when selling your miscellaneous items. Yes, you want to sell a antique videotape because you have no other reason to have it. But no, you don't want to sell your digipix, right? Because you need those. And then lastly, you could choose to view all. Viewing all can be really nice because like we kind of touched on earlier, if you want to sort by value so you could sell something really valuable or if you want to sort by mass so you could get rid of the heavy things, maybe you want to make sure you sell the heaviest stuff first because you're having inventory problems and you don't want to get get rid of anything, but you definitely want to fix your weight problems Then sort by mass and make sure you sell all the heavy stuff first. Get that out of your inventory. Then down here below, you've got credits. This will show you how many credits you have so far. We're at almost half a million here. And we've got a mass of 233 out of 235. Like I said, I'm always full in this game. I did make a spaceship though with tons and tons of inventory, man. I added so many cargo bays to this thing so I can go dump all of that into my ship and I'll be right as rain. But that covers the inventory. I think that's everything you need to know about the inventory and how that works. Down here in the bottom, you've got some hotkeys for system, set course, and back. System is this. It's your menu screen, just in case you're wondering. Set course is going to set you on the course of whatever objective you have set at the moment. Right. So right now, Supra ET Ultra, it's register for the Vanguard. It's a very early quest. You can say set course to that thing and it will do that. This is going to be how you find quests in the game, which is one of the most confusing things to do early on. So I'm going to devote like a whole section to quests and how you find them and how do you get around, which I'll do in an upcoming section here. Next, we have our ship. You've got the name of your ship. This is one that I commandeered. I found it and took it. I killed the people on board and made it mine because it was way better than the ship I had, which was sweet. And then it tells you the class A and the higher the class, the higher your pilot skills need to be in order to fly the ship. So this is class A, which means it's something that just about anybody could fly. It can hold up to four crew members. So you can assign crew members to certain stations to get their benefits, right? Your crew members have perks, like you have perks or skills, right? A crew member might have a skill instead of scanning, like I've got right here. It might have a thing that says that they're better at ballistics. And so your ballistics on your ship would be better, right? So that's kind of going to be how you choose your crew, which we'll get into that. Don't worry. Then you've got whole, your whole's health. This is the health of your ship. If it's at 100%, your ship's health is at full. Before an enemy can damage your hull, they have to deplete your shields. Your shields will recharge automatically anytime they don't take damage for a little while. Your hull will not heal automatically, right? That's the difference between your hull and your shields. Your hull has to be manually healed by either you or by an NPC at a landing site. Or if you go to like some kind of ship bay, there will oftentimes be an NPC there that can repair your ship for you. And it's very cheap to do so. So always repair your ship with the NPC rather than repairing your ship with the ship repair kits because the ship repair kits are infinitely harder to come by. Something to note there. So we click on the ship here. Here is the ship that I'm using right now. It's got this reactor. The reactor is what decides how much energy it has to dispense, right? In order to put higher quality components on this ship, I need better quality reactors. So if I want to put a more powerful grav jump, I'm probably going to need a more powerful reactor. It says we've got a crew of four. I can assign four people to four different stations on this thing and it can jump 22 light years. There is a quest that requires you to be able to jump at least 21 light years. That's the only quest I've had to do so far that had like a minimum threshold for light years that I didn't at first meet. So just be aware of that. You probably will want to be able to get at least 21 light years out of your ship at some point. It's pretty late in the game, so don't worry about it early on. But so far, that was the one benchmark I had to meet with my jumps and then your shield, right? 
like this is the health the enemy has to destroy before they can start actually hurting your ship. Then you've got your particle weapons, your ballistics, and your missiles. How much damage each of those do. This ship is worth 138,000. Its mass is 1,125. Now, in the ship's case, the mass is not your carry capacity. That's listed up here. So at the top, we've got fuel, which determines like how far you can go in combination with your grab jump. And then you've got your hull, which is your health. And then your cargo capacity, 1,611 out of 2,760, right? We've got that. And then shielded capacity, zero, which means, unfortunately, I cannot safely hide any of those items with the gold stolen marker on them. I can't hide them from authorities. If I ever grab jump into their system, they're going to scan me and they're going to see it right Right away. And if they do, they're going to tell me that, hey, we're going to confiscate that. So they're going to find me, take those items and every other item that I have that's stolen away from me. And that's where the real pain in getting caught comes from. It's not losing the gold items. It's losing every single red item that you have. It can be a bit of a pain. However, I will say maybe get caught once because maybe there's a cool quest that happens when you get caught once. Possibly. No spoilers. Just saying, you know, try everything once in this game, even if you save right before you do it, <laughs> just in case there's a really cool quest line locked behind it. Then at the top here, you can see particle, ballistics, missile, engine, shield, grav. And the more points you put into any of these things, the stronger they are. You can take points out of this system and put it into shield, or you can take points out of engine and put it in a missile or ballistics, right? But you can't put more points into them than they are capable of using. This particle weapon is kind of weak, right? Only three bars of power can be put into there. In order to replace it, if we hover over it, right? Here it is. See it lighting up down there? Little weapon right here. So in order to be able to put more points into that, I would have to replace that with a better particle weapon in the ship builder here, right? I think that the ship building system and the ship parts system and the ship flying, I think this is going to be the most confusing part of the whole game for a lot of people. Once they understand skills, this is going to be the next kind of big hurdle. You know, what am I allowed to do and why am I allowed to do it? And how important is all of it? And how does it work? Right. I think that's going to be like the most confusing thing. So we're going to cover that now below select system. You can hover over this bar and it tells you what your reactor is. It's a class A reactor. If you want to put better components on your ship, then you're going to need a better reactor to power them right? Your reactor is supplying power and really good components, like really good engines, really good weapons. These things are going to require more power than a low tier reactor is going to be able to provide. So just be aware if you go and start swapping out pieces on your ship, a lot of times one of the hurdles you're going to have is you'll put a new item on and it'll be like, oh, well, now your reactor is not good enough. And you'll put a new item on and it'll be like, oh, now you weigh too much and you need better engines, right? And it's very much a domino effect where you replace one thing and it's going to require you to place another thing. Fortunately, they've got a really cool system in here that's going to help us kind of figure that out. Before I jump into the nitty gritty of the ship, though, let's talk about the other buttons here. You can inspect it, right? That's just going to let you look at the ship. This is basically just, you know, kind of a cosmetic looks kind of thing. Then you've got crew here. You can check out your crew who's assigned to what. Remember when I was talking about what they have that is applicable? So you can see here I slotted Sarah Morgan because she's got Astrodynamics. I slotted Sam Coe because he's got piloting and payload perks here. And then I slotted Raphael because he's got engineering. So all these people are giving me these little extra perks for my character. Barrett would be a good one to slot too because he's got Starship Engineering particle beam weapon system. So even if you don't want Barrett following you around when you're out in the system running around on a planet, right? You can assign him to your ship. So he just rides around in your ship and he mans one of the posts and he's going to give you these perks. If I wanted to slot Barrett, what I could do is you can see you press E to assign, you press R to unassign. So I would click on Raphael, press R here, whatever that button is on console. And then you click confirm and then you click on to Barrett and you assign him. And there you go. Now, Barrett is a crew member on the ship. So it's real easy to come in here. And again, when you're ready for that, it's real easy to get to it. Ship crew. That's how you get to it. Click on your ship right here. Click on your crew and you can change these people out anytime you want. You can also filter by the ship. You can also filter by outposts. Who's on what outposts? We'll do an outpost section later in the video. And then next, you can see the cargo hold of your ship. So you can see everything that your ship is holding on to here. All of the stuff in my ship. Likewise, and just as important as seeing everything that your ship is holding on to, right? Like this ship has 41 weapons. <laughs> it's just sitting on it, right? I'm saving those for various reasons. Most of them are just being saved to sell. We can also, though, just as important is we can click inventory. Now we are looking at our inventory. This is my inventory of my character. And the great thing about this is I can go resources and then I can click right here, store all. 
boom. Now all those resources are on my ship and not on my character. My character's mass just went from 233 to 193, right? My inventory problem is immediately getting improved. And I could do that with extra weapons that I don't need, right? Like, uh, I'm going to just sell these eventually when I have a chance because you can sell from your ship. This is why it's great to have things on your ship because if it's on your ship, you can still sell it. Now we're down to 174 really quickly fixing that inventory problem we had just by clicking on our cargo hold. Now you don't have to come here to get to your cargo hold. You can also get to your cargo hold by being in your ship and opening up your inventory in there and there'll be a button to get to it. There's lots of ways to get to that screen, but one of the ways is simply by just clicking ship cargo hold. Make sure you double check which inventory you're looking at because on more than one occasion, since this looks identical, save for the text at the top, I have been transferring items the wrong direction and it says inventory here and it says spaceship here and it's like, wait, which one am I looking at? You're looking at the one that's listed at the top. This button will take you to your inventory. Now it would take you back to your ship. Now you're going to take you to the inventory, right? Just kind of be aware of that little slightly confusing factor. Before we get into the weeds of shipbuilding, let's cover some more of these topical points that we can cover a lot faster. So to finish out our UI on this menu screen right here, you've got your name, your level, and your XP right here. If you ever want to see how close you are to leveling at a glance, you can see right here, I'm like 95% done leveling. There's this little gray bar at the end. That's how close I am to leveling. So if I was ever curious, like, and I just want to see it at a glance, Okay, next, let's go over your star map. This is going to be a really important section. The first map. So if you're on a planet and you open your star map, you're going to see this. Another way to get here is just by pressing M, right? It's a quick key to your star map. There's actually a quick key, at least on PC, probably on console also. You can get to your inventory in one click just by pressing I. You can get to your map by pressing M, P to get to your skills. But if we open up the star map, we can use this to one, fast travel to places right here and you can just click on it. It'll ask you, do you want to fast travel to the location? Yes. So you can fast travel. Another way to fast travel, like if you're going somewhere on the same planet, you can open up your scanner and look at the symbol and that'll let you fast travel. So if I click there, it says fast travel to the select location. Yes. I can click on this one, fast travel to that location. Yeah. So you can just use that to get around to places that you've already been. You do have to have been there. So if it's white, you can fast travel to it. If it's gray, like this icon, that means you've not been there and you can't fast travel to it yet. So this is your map of the area here. When you're on a planet, you do not get to run for infinity. A lot of people are wondering, can you run all the way around a planet? Like start in one spot, run all the way around, come back on the other side and get to back where you started. No, there is a limit to how far you can go. Now, I've never run into that border in my first 40 hours of play, and I have run a long way from my ship. So I think the size of these zones on each planet is both significant and sufficient. Think about landing on the moon in real life. If you were to land on the moon and you started running around the moon, it's going to mostly look exactly the same the whole way around, with the exception of a few key points of interest in this game, more so than in real life, right? Because in this game, there's going to be unknown locations for you to visit. There's going to be buildings, abandoned facilities. There's going to be anomalies. There's going to be caves, right? Whereas in real life, really, you're just going to be looking at it the exact exact same thing for the days, weeks, months, and years it takes you to walk all the way around it. Not a big loss in my opinion, not being able to walk around these planets and more focusing all the points of interest kind of like in a location around that landing site. But here's what you can do though. If you hover over this point of interest here, it shows you all the places you can go there. Now that hexagon means I have a quest there that I can do. The blue one means that I'm tracking that quest that I could do. So that's the quest I'm tracking. This is just another generic quest that I have and could do in those places, right? We click on this. There's no quest that I'm doing. There's nothing taking me there, but I did discover this outpost. I do know about it. So I could click on it and fast travel to it, right? And I could click on any of these and fast travel to them as well. So just clicking on a place on a planet lets you fast travel there. Now, let's say you wanted to travel to somewhere that wasn't on this planet or this moon, something farther away. So you back one more time, which on PC is tap. Now we're zoomed out a little more. Now we can see all the planets in this solar system. We could go to this place. We could click on this planet and it'll zoom in on that planet. And we can look at the points of interest that we have found there so far. This doesn't mean that these are the only ones. It just means that's what we know of right now. So that's how you can travel around the solar system. You just click on a place and then you could say set course and you can fast travel to that location. Let's say we wanted to fast travel to this moon, right? And this moon, we don't have any locations on it. So we'll just fast travel there. Yes, this is going to put us through a load screen. Now we are here looking at this moon and not much to it right now. We can scan it. 
We can see what resources. It's got helium three and iron on it. Okay, nice. It's got an extreme environment. So we know a little bit about it by scanning it now that we're here. We'll hide the resources. And then you can click anywhere you want and try to land on it. If you're on PC, I've noticed this game was definitely made with Xbox UI in mind first. So if you're on PC, there's a little bit of funkiness to some of the UI that I'm sure will be cleaned up in future patches. If you click on a planet to try to land on it and it's not doing anything, you might have to click a few times to get it to like show up. Okay, so now we click land and now we're going to go through a cutscene to land, right? So landing is a cutscene, taking off is a cutscene. Sometimes it'll make you watch the cutscene, sometimes it won't. If you've already been there before, it'll generally let you skip the cutscene. So we're on this planet. We can exit the ship. And now that we're here on this new planet, we can open up our scanner and we can find the points of interest. Okay, there's one. Uh, what else we got out here? Anything on the other side of the ship, maybe? Yeah, oh, there's another one. It says unknown. Let's scan it. It's a structure. Another one over there, unknown. That's a structure, right? So there's actually quite a few different things we could go find. We open up the map now. And we can see, here we are. Here's this one place we found. Here's another one. So here's some key points of interest. Still tons for us to go and explore. And once we've been to those places, we could come back here and fast travel to any of them at a future time. So now let's get in our ship and take off. So to get in your ship and take off, you're always going to enter through your little bay. Although you can skip this step once you know, you're know you familiar with like all the controls and stuff. You can either walk up and actually do it or you can just fast travel from outside your ship. You don't ever have to like go in your ship except for a few situations where if you are docked onto some space station, it might not let you travel until you detach from that space station. It'll be like, you got to detach from the station. You have to undock before you can fast travel. Like, okay, fine. I'll get in my ship and undock and then fast travel. But you can come up to this, right? When you get to the entry bay here, you can either board or go straight to the cockpit. Most times you'll probably just want to go straight to your cockpit. So you hit that button and from here you can take off. So we hold that button down. We're going to take off. It's a space bar on PC. And it's going to tell you what button it is on console. And you're going to get this nice little animation that takes you off into space as it loads that new area. This is basically a load screen and we're back in space. Now, when we look at this planet, we've got this one landing site that we have been to and that we've explored. So we could fast travel straight there in the future if we wanted to. Now, that's how you go around from one place to another in a solar system. What if you want to go somewhere even farther away, right? Because there's a lot more than just this solar system in the game. So we tab out one more time or go back. And here are tons of different solar systems that we could travel to, right? Light years apart. And in order to get to these, the white ones will be the ones you visited and the red ones will be the ones you haven't visited. So if you hover over one and it'll tell you if you can get there. And there's some information right here. It says this is a level 40 area. This is a level 55 area. See how it says that in the top left? This is a level 45 area. So as you start getting to more and more difficult places, you'll notice that. And that's basically how it works. Like as you move from left to right, things start getting higher and higher level, getting harder and harder to get to, requiring bigger and bigger jumps. OK, so if we want to go to one of these other systems, we could. Let's go to Seoul. OK, so we click on Seoul. And then we can pick where we want to go once we get here. Now, anytime you go from one system to another system, that's when you're going to get scanned, right? If you have contraband on you, harvested organs from some person or some drug or some weapon, if you have contraband on you, that's hype. When you're going from one system to another, that's when you're going to get scanned. It's that jump right there. Once you're in a system moving around in that system, you're mostly safe. But when you leave one and go to another, it's always upon entering. Watch, we'll trigger it right now. We'll teleport to this system and we'll go to Mars. Okay, that course jump. We're gonna do our grab jump, get a nice little cutscene. Okay, now right here it tells you entering patrolled area, no contraband on ship. Wait for scan. Scan in progress. No contraband on ship. Scan passed. Okay, so we passed the scan. If we had any contraband, they would have been like, hey, sir, we need you to come with us. And you're like, oh, okay. Or you can say, die, scum. And then like 30 ships will attack you. I don't know how many it is. It's a lot. It's not a decision you would want to take lightly. So in the event that you jump into an area and you find that you have contraband or you remember oh man i forgot i picked up some contraband and i didn't drop it off somewhere you're not totally doomed you can immediately open your inventory go to your cargo holds go to your inventory now from here let's say that this spacesuit was the contraband it's not but we could put it in there and then we could go back to the ship's inventory from here we can click on spacesuits let's say it was this suit right here that was the contraband we can down here jettison 
but you can only jettison an item if it's in the ship's hold, not if it's in your inventory. So if you're carrying it, you have to open your menu, put the item into your ship, and then from your ship, you have to jettison the item out. This is important. This is going to happen to you. You're going to find one of those contraband items. You're going to pick it up saying, oh yeah, I'll just deal with it before I change systems. You'll forget. And the downside is, like I said, they take everything. They take those items, but they also take every stolen item from you and they also find you. And they might also start a quest line. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. So it's not the end of the world if you get caught. But if you find yourself in a situation where you're like, oh, man, I don't want to go back to the last save. It's way too long ago. And I don't want to lose everything on me right now. You can just jettison the one items or two items that are contraband if you want to. There's a lot of contraband in the game. You'll see it fairly often. It sells pretty well, way better than pretty much anything else. But also in the grand scheme of things, it's not that big a deal if you have to jettison a little bit to save your last 30 or 40 minutes of progress. So that's how jettisoning works. And it's really useful when boarding into a system and you see that thing coming up saying, you're getting scanned and you realize, oh man, okay. So you panic and you just jettison. Now that we pass the scan though, we're here. We can choose to go anywhere we want in the system. We went straight to Mars and we could choose to go here because look, we have a hexagon. That means that there's a quest there. We could go knock out or we could choose to go to one of these other locations. So that's how you travel from one solar system to another and that's the one thing you kind of have to be wary of when traveling from one solar system to another is you are going to get scanned every time you enter and if you have contraband can be kind of a pain in the butt either don't pick up the contraband until you're ready to offload it somewhere safe or you have a safe way to hide it from the authorities because you built it into your ship at the shipyard anytime you are orbiting a planet you can press r and show the resources occasionally there will be a button there it says new info available if you scan it again so you know if you see that do it you might learn something new, you might find a new cave, a new place you can visit, or maybe some new materials or traits on that planet. You can hop from one place in the solar system to another without getting scanned. So if we jump to Jupiter, we can do that. And we're not going to get scanned again because we already got scanned coming in. This is why I say you only really have to worry about it when you're changing solar systems. If you're trying to go somewhere, another thing you can do, just like when you're on a planet and you open up your scanner, you can teleport to a place. Well, same thing here. If you open the scanner and you press your scan button, which is E on PC, it's going to bring this up and it says mission, hold down R. So if we hold R, it's going to automatically fast travel us to that quest, right? Now we're crab jumping there. So that's another way, like if you don't want to go through the whole map system, you can just point and click. You can go, oh, I want to go to that marker right there. And you can do the same thing here. I can say F scan and it'll be like open planet map. Yeah. And I want to go here. It won't let me fast travel right now because I was being scanned. But now scanning's over and I would be able to fast travel onto the planet. Like a little landing there. Okay, next let's talk about companions really quick. Companions are pretty straightforward. Each of them has their own personality, their own likes and dislikes. And basically what you do is right here, it says, wait here a moment. If you're talking to a companion that is already following you. If it's a companion that's not following you, what you can instead do is tell it to join you. And whichever one's following you will stay back at the lodge or back on the ship, depending on where you have them stationed. And the new companion will follow you around. So she's already following me. So I could tell her to wait here a moment, which is great to do if Sarah, for instance, she really has a strong moral compass. If you do something bad in front of her, she's not going to like it. But she's also a very likable character. So you may want her to like you. You may want to try to flirt with her. You may want to stay on her good side. Whatever you try to do with her, you might have to sometimes do something she's not going to like. Or maybe that's going to be in the best interest of your mission, right? And so what you could do is you could say, wait here a moment. You could go in inside the room or the building and leave her behind, kill who you have to kill, say what you have to say, things that normally cause her to dislike you for a moment or would at least slightly reduce your report with her. So that's when you would use wait here a moment. You know you're about to do something she's not going to like, kind of leave her behind for a second without replacing her or removing her from you. You just remember to go back and grab her again when you're done doing it. You can talk to them, ask them questions, get to know them. It's another way to get to know them better, get their lore, sometimes to improve your rapport with them, say things that they like or say things that they might even love. And then also, occasionally your companions will have something for you. They'll find something along the way. They'll grab something along the way that they think you might like. So in this case, we can say, hey, do you have something for me? If that dialogue option is there, that means they have something for you. And they'll also say it out loud. Like when you get on your ship, she'll say, hey, I've got something for you. And so that's your cue. When you have a chance, talk to her and say, hey, what do you got for me? And she says, yep, I got it. So nutrient sap added just a nice little thing, little nutrient there for me. It's not usually something super major or life changing, but just something 
something small and helpful. The best thing about the companion though is the ability to trade gear with them. They are essentially an extra body to store gear on. They can hold a weight of 135. So right now she's got two. I've emptied her out pretty good. And so I can put a ton of stuff on her. The next time I go out, I can put 133 or so weight onto her so that I don't get encumbered. Or as soon as I start getting encumbered, I could toss it on her, right? Very familiar if you've played previous Bethesda games. Same system there. And it's still amazing to have them around for the reason for that reason. In fact, I would argue that that is their most useful ability is their ability to carry your burdens. And then like we touched on earlier, if you go to your ship and you go to crew, you can look at all of the companions that you found so far or your crew, as it were. And you can look at where you have them assigned. Sometimes they're going to be assigned to a outpost. Sometimes they'll be assigned to your ship, the ecliptic combat. That's the ship I stole. So that's what that stands for. Ecliptic combat is my ship. So those people are assigned to it. These people are unassigned. And like I touched on earlier, where you assign your companions and your crew is going to depend on their skills that they have. So if you see like four in something, or if you see four in piloting, you're like, Hey man, that sounds nice. Let's put that guy on the ship so that we can pilot better. Or so Lynn here, for instance, she's got a skill for outpost management. So you might want to stick her at an outpost, let her manage that thing. Barrett, you might want to assign to your ship so that you have better particle beam weapon systems, right? It's a really, really cool system with the companions, what they've done here. You can do some pretty cool stuff. You can get a lot of uses out of them now with the ability to assign them to your ship and to outposts, as well as to have one follow you around all the time. And you do get the option to flirt with the companions. You'll see it. It'll be in brackets before the sentence that you're about to say, it'll say flirt. And you can say that thing if you want to try to maybe push your relationship with that companion to the next level. Okay, now let's go over how lock picking works in Starfield. You'll see something like this, a safe cabinet, anything like that, a door. And it'll say unlock and then below that in parentheses, it'll say the difficulty. So if it's novice, you can unlock it without having security as a skill. But in order to unlock anything beyond novice, you're going to have to put points into security. So if having to walk by things that you wish you could open and see what's inside, it's going to bother you. Make sure you put some points into security and level that up. And it's better to do it earlier than later if you're going to do it. So if you're going to do it, commit to it early because there's challenges each step of the way where you need to open these safes in order to level up to the next level. So you're going to interact with it. Your digit pick is going to come out. You're going to have to collect digit picks. These are like lock picks that you would collect in any other game. And so as long as you have a digit pick available, you will be able to lock pick. So there's a lot of information being given to you right away with these digit picks and the lock pick mechanisms here. First of all, we can see this is advanced. These are all the different picks that we're going to have to be able to slot into these holes here. Basically, what you're trying to do is fill it up. So you want to fill every hole with these. So you're going to twist them around and line them up. Okay, so if we did this, this would fill these two holes and this one would fill these two holes. So all of these holes would be filled if we use just these two right here. Another piece of information being given to you that's not obvious at all is that the line around the outside is blue, which means this will fit somewhere in here. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the one you should use, but it means it will fit. If we click on this one here, it says that it will work in the inner one. See how it's blue and this one's blue. But if we click here, the inner one is white. The outer one is blue, so it would only work on the outer ring. So you don't have to worry about saving it for the inner ring. So this one worked for the outer ring only. That means we want to use it out here, right? And so we'll go ahead and use those. Now we can see by clicking on these again, which ones are viable options. So this we can just ignore, right? It's white. It doesn't fit on there. We don't have to sit here twisting it around trying to figure out where it goes. This one fits, this one fits, and this one fits. No. So there's a lot of options here for us. So let's see what it wants us to do. This one here would go here. This one would go there, but that's conflicting with the other one. And this one doesn't fit. This one doesn't fit. So it looks like the only way to do this would be to go like this. So this one's getting these two all here and this one's getting these two here. And open it. Now, before I open this, let's talk about some stuff that you have down here. If you are leveling up security, you're going to get these things called auto slots. These would be wise to use when there's an advanced lock and it starts right away. And you have a mechanism that will work on like the first layer, the second, the third and the fourth layer, right? There's tons of layers where that one is viable and you're not sure, should I use it now or do I need to save it for later in order to successfully get all the way down to the bottom of this thing? And so against those tougher ones, you can say, OK, just tell me one of the ones that works right now and it will do that for you. You can also tell it to eliminate 
eliminate all unused keys. So if there's one that you're not supposed to use all the way through it, you can eliminate all the keys with this button here. However, this is going to expend a digipick. So you're going to consume one of your digipicks. Now, digipicks are fairly rare, but they're not super rare. If you are a very thorough scavenger, you will find lots of them. And I have typically found as many as I need, but just barely. So I'm never sitting on like 20 digipicks. I am usually finding one or finding two, and then I'm finding two locker soap, and then I'm finding another couple, and then finding another couple of locker soap. And right, it's pretty balanced in terms of how many you find and how many things you find to unlock. So you will go through them. So use them sparingly, especially use this ability sparingly if you do decide to use it. I found that, you know, what's easier than doing this is just do a quick save right before you try to unlock one of these things. And then worse comes to worse if you fail it. You you don't have to waste one of your keys. You can just reload your last save real quick. So try to get in the habit of saving right before you do one of these, just in case you're low on digipix and you have one because, you know, that kind of feels bad. You can also choose to undo. So if I had a digipick to use, I don't because I used my last digipick to pick this lock. But if I had another one available, I could use a digipick to pull one out. Maybe I was like, oh man, I'm so far into this. I wish I could just undo my last move. You can do that. You can undo your last move for the cost of one digipick. Generally, that's not worth it because unless you know for sure that that one undo is going to save the entire attempt, otherwise you might be wasting that one and the one that you spent getting into it right? So you're going to be wasting a lot of keys for a failed attempt, which isn't good. So just for science here, though, we're going to go ahead and hit auto slot. We'll hit this one just so you see what happens here. I'm going to spin these all away from the position and it's going to automatically put this one there. Boom. And like I said, you want to use that earlier than later. You can store more and more of these based on your security level. So at low security levels, you can't store very many auto slots, but later on, you will be able to store up to four or five. I forget the exact number. It tells you in the description here. And so make sure you're using them because it does cap out and then you're just kind of wasting your time thinking about picking locks that you could potentially just bypass by using your auto slot early on and make it a lot easier, save you a bunch of time. So make sure to use them. It does cap out on the number of charges you can store anyway. So let's see what's inside here. And this one has some ammo, heart plus a med pack and two and nice man, nice. So we found some cool stuff in here. Oh, and there's a new digipick sitting right next to it. See how that works. A lot of times you'll find a digipick just before, just after opening one of these kind of keeping you barely stocked up on having them. So now I'll be able to find one at the next thing I go to. It doesn't always work out that way, but this time it did. Another thing to be aware of is your jetpack, how it works, how you get it. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to get a jetpack given to you as part of the main story really early on. You'll get it. You can't miss it. So don't worry about getting it. You'll get it right away. But you will need to have the perk boost pack training, right? You got to have level one of that in order to use your jetpack. So they might very well give it to you before you have this unlocked and you won't even be able to use it. So make sure you grab this early on. That's another one that's just you got to get it if you want to be able to do the fun things. Also, you only need one point into that. So, you know, don't stress about getting all the points. Just make sure you get one point into it earlier than later. Another thing that's really nice about this game is grappling. You can grapple onto objects to climb up them. So if I want to get up on this, my character will reach out, grab it and pull me up. Put our weapon away here so you maybe can see it better. So if we jump. The hands come out. This is really nice, especially when you're on a planet with stronger gravity. So your jetpack becomes a bit less useful in terms of getting up to those higher places that you need to get to. You will probably at some point decide that you need some more healing kits. They are pretty scarce out in the wild, especially if you start pushing into higher level content early on. So if you need more of those, come to Reliant Medical. It's that symbol right there and talk to a doctor and he will be able to heal you. If you ask him for help, he'll heal you up. You can say I could use some medical supplies. I could even get rid of my alien DNA if I wanted to. I'm okay with having it though. I don't mind it. So I say I need help doc. So we'll say I could use some medical supplies and here you'll be able to buy the thing that you need. The most commonly used for me has been the med pack. This is going to restore 30% of your health. In my case, around 300 HP, whereas the food I find gives somewhere between one and 12 most often. So that's pretty huge getting 300 HP. So this is very effective to have around. He's only selling six of them, right? So it is a finite supply, but you can come back and check after restocks and you can visit other reliant medical centers in other towns as well and here's what the building looks from the outside okay the next thing we'll talk about is going to be enhanced this is where you can come and change your character's appearance so just look for enhance here in neon it's pretty easy to find you just head down the middle strip you've got reliant medical right there you've got enhance right here along with a bunch of other shops that are pretty handy and you talk to the 
lady inside and it's only going to cost you 500 credits to change your appearance. Now you will want to take off your clothing or your under suit before you come in here if you want to be able to see your character's face. So we'll come in here. We'll take this off. Now we should be able to adjust our character's appearance. And there we go. Now we can see our character. We can change his look, his face, his body, you know, change that body shape if we want to make him look a little different. Uh, the world is your oyster here. So have fun with that. And just in case you need to refer back to this later because you're trying to find Neon, but you don't remember where it is because Neon does have some really important places and you're going to be coming back here often. It's going to be in the Vol 2 system. So look for that on the map right there. Vol 2. If you're ever on this map looking for the lodge, it's going to be here in Alpha Centauri. Come here, click on Jemison, and it's going to be here just in case you open up the map at some point and you're like, wait, how do I get back where I came from? I know that happened to me a few times when I first started playing. All right, let's talk about your quests, or in this game, as they're called, your different missions. You can filter your quests if you want to by all, by main quests, by faction, by miscellaneous, by mission, and by activity. You've got your main quests, all these here that you can do. There's not just one main quest because sometimes there'll be multiple different paths you can go, multiple directions you can go with your main quest. Then you've got your faction quest. This is going to be different factions, different quest lines that you can do throughout the game. Sometimes it's maybe a gang or a fleet or an authority or all kinds of different types of factions that you'll run into and be able to work alongside for some kind of payoff at the end. If you start one of these, that means it's probably going to be a pretty substantial quest chain. If it has its own symbol, it's a big thing. It's a long quest chain for either a faction, a company or something like that, right? Next, you've got miscellaneous. These are kind of like side quests. A lot of times these feel like side quests in any other game. Not to be discounted though. They can be pretty fun, pretty interesting, pretty rewarding. Same with missions. These are going to be random missions from your constellation group to like find things out in the game. It says locate, right? Locate these things. Then there's activities. Activities are not to be underestimated. They look pretty dull here. Go talk to this guy. Go talk to that guy, right? Go talk to that guy. They look pretty dull at first glance. It says speak to Bog. How do I compare that to a faction mission where I'm doing this, that, and the other thing, right? Well, activities can lead to some really spectacular things. So don't write them off. Definitely do them. Some of the best content in the game is locked behind some of these really random activities. You'll start one and then it'll start some crazy quest chain, some crazy place. So don't underestimate the activities. Like you'll be walking through the street and you'll overhear someone say something and you don't even have to accept it. It just Boop, it pops it here into your activities list. Go talk to this person. You overheard someone say this. You overheard someone say that, right? You're going to get lots of activities that you can go do. If you're a completionist like me, this means you're going to be busy for a long, long time. Time. I have been trying to do everything that I find in this game and look how behind I am. I'm 40 hours in and I've still got so much to do. I started pushing the main quest a little bit because I wanted to understand the game as much as possible and unlock some of the later systems so that I could explain them to you here. So I did fall behind on some of these activities more than I probably would have if I wasn't on a mission to make this video for you guys. So these activities, sometimes they're really quick little side quests and sometimes these open up some of the most interesting side quests with some of the most interesting rewards. So don't ignore the activities. That's all I'm going to say. The quests in this game are just so fantastic and so fun. I'm going to say that about all of this stuff, man. Do it all in at least one of your playthroughs. Try to hit everything because you never know what you're missing. There's some really cool stuff out there in this game. So that's the different types of quests that you have. So let's pick an innocuous one here to try to avoid spoilers. Speak to Bog. OK, if I wanted to go do the Bog quest by clicking on it, it's now the active, by the way. See how this turned blue? If I click this and click here, this one's blue. That means this is the quest that's being tracked. This quest chain right here is being tracked. If I click on this one here, this is blue. So this quest chain is being tracked. So if we do this and it says speak to Bog, I can press R, right? I don't need to know where that's at. Doesn't matter how I get there with my map, right? I don't have to open the star map and then sort through all of the galaxies and all of the solar systems and then fast travel there. I can just hit this button here, set course. And it's going to take me there, right? I'm already on this planet. Coincidentally, it says you need to go to the lodge. That's the closest waypoint to have me land and it's going to set me there in that zone so that I can do that quest. So now I just kind of spin around and there's the quest marker right there. There's the one I'm tracking. So I would just run to that, right? And that's how easy it is to track quests in this game. It's not the most intuitive thing right off the bat, but as soon as like it clicks and you understand it, hopefully me explaining kind of made it click, you know, you just open it up, click on it. Now, let's say I wanted to do this one here. I'm going to click on it, right? And I click set course. It says set course to Montero Luna. Yes. 
now look, we're traveling across the galaxy here, right? So we're jumping, hold that down, and it takes us right there. We're changing solar systems, so they're doing a scan on us. We're waiting for that scan to complete. We got 20 XP because it's our first time flying to this place. But we've got two things we could do from this point. We could us L on PC, and it takes us back to this menu here, and we can say set course again, and now it's going to actually land us, right? Because we had to get scanned coming in, so we couldn't just go straight to the planet. Now we're on the planet, and there's a quest here to do. So there's going to be a lot of load screens in this game, leaving planets, coming to planets, changing solar systems. So, you know, kind of get comfortable with that. And the easiest way to cut some of the load screens out is to fast travel from where you're standing. So rather than boarding your ship manually, you can save yourself load screen or two by simply saying, I want to go here, set course, right? Now, by going straight there, we skipped the load screen getting onto the ship. We skipped the animation taking off. We are now landed and we're on that planet. Boom. Look at that. We skipped the grab jump cutscene. We skipped the landing cutscene. And now we're in neon. So using fast travel can save you a lot of cutscenes if you do it right rather than manually getting into the ship and then manually taking off and then manually changing solar systems manually, right? Take advantage of the fast travel thing. It's going to save you so much time and it's going to cut a lot of load screens out. If you enjoy the load screens and you enjoy that feeling of flying from one place to another, hey, live your best life. But if you want to cut out a few load screens later in the game, this is the way to do it. Now, if I'm trying to go to Feynman here, I click on it. Here's some information. It's telling me it's going to take four jumps. My jump range on my ship is 22 light years and the distance is 75. So as long as no single jump is greater than 22 light years, because that's the range of my ship, I can get there. If this last jump had been 23, it would have said, oh, you can't make it to Feynman. It also tells you what your fuel consumption is here. So if you try to go somewhere really far away, even then I'm only using 199 out of my 550 fuel consumption. I can't do this jump because I need to go one at a time. So what happens here is from here to here, I can't do this because I've never been here. So I would have to go here. And then after going there manually, I could go to the next place and then I could go to the next place, right? I'd have to do these jumps manually one at a time for the first time, see those places, unlock that place, and then I can jump to the place beyond it. If you see a red line like this, all that means is you need to go to the first spot that's red, jump there manually, unlock it. Then from there, you can jump to the next one that was red and the next one and so on. If you encounter that problem trying to jump, it says unexplored route. You just got to manually explore it first. Take a look at it. Put your eyes on that solar system. Jump to the next one. When that's the case, it's pretty clear. It says that you have not explored every system along this route. And then right here, it says unexplored route, right? So it's telling you that's what you got to do. All right. And I think that covers everything for the star map, how it works, how you fast travel in this game, how to get around, right? Getting around is really easy. Once you get used to it, doing your missions is is real easy once you get used to using this coming in here you can only track one at a time so just kind of be aware of that if you click on this all you're tracking is this one that's the only one that's going to show up right here it's got the little ship symbol on the blue thing telling me hey you need to go back to your ship to do this one we do but we don't right because we could just hit set course and we can tell it to go there and land right we don't actually have to go back to the ship we could just fast travel skip the running to the ship skip the takeoff animation skip the grab jump animation skip the land animation skip all of that so earlier we touched on the power of the scanner right you can use it to fast travel you open up the scanner and then you can fast travel places but what we didn't touch on was the stuff you can do with it besides fast travel so what you can do is run up to things and scan them and this is going to be how you fully survey your planet you just kind of scan this thing here there we just moved it up from 50 to 63 percent scanned oh my god so we got to put that away and uh there we go okay so we scanned that bad boy <laughs> <laughs> and make sure and then we can go look at the stuff uh we can scan this mineral there we go um we can scan these sunflowers 13 percent scanned now because we scanned one all right and scan this thing here that went from 25 to 38 right and we're filling it up slowly filling up our completion of scanning this area so that's one reason to use the scanner another thing is down at the bottom you can see it says show resources which is what you know if we're looking at a rock or something it'll say uh let's see show resources and if we're looking at an animal 
it'll say social. So it'll tell you, is it temperamental? Like, is it going to attack you? And it tells you right there, temperament, territorial resource, amino acids, biome, swamp, hill, savanna, right? So all those cool things. That's the scanner. Next to it, we have surface map. That's how we can get to this map right here if we want to. Next to that, you have photo mode. So you can use this to take pictures if you want. And finally, we can adjust the zoom. All right, but let's go back to outposts. All right, so another thing you can do with the scanner is make outposts. So we can start one and rotate it, you know, move it here, go set it there, set it here. So we'll put it right here. You can get extractors. So on this planet, we can extract a couple of things, water and aluminum. Aluminum is not a bad one to extract. You're going to need it. You'll notice there on the left, it tells you what materials you need to craft this item. And aluminum, if we cycle through them, you'll notice that aluminum is a pretty common one. I just went and grabbed a bunch of aluminum so I could kind of showcase this for you here. So as an example, let's go ahead and make a water extractor. The water extractor requires power in order to function. Build a power source from the power category provide this object with power. Okay. So let's toggle through power. Okay. So we've got solar array, wind turbine, power switch, All right? So let's go ahead and make one of these solar arrays here. Let's get it rotated. We won't worry too much about the design here. This is more of a how to than a look. Okay. So don't judge. Um, here goes. There we go. Okay, so now we have a power source. You've powered your first object. Congratulations. So the water is excavating. You know, it's, it's pulling out some water. It says that this creates six power. This uses five power. So if we made another one of these, we'd already be out of power. We'd have to make another one. So another thing we would want to make here is maybe have, if we were going to be checking back up on this every once in a while, we would maybe make a storage container for liquid, right? Because this is going to get a bunch of liquid. We can also make structures. So if you want to make a structure that you can get inside of, you're going to need something like this, right? So we'll put this over here. Let's create the bigger section of it first. And you can see a lot of these are requiring aluminum, which is why I'm doing this here on this planet as an example, because there was a lot of aluminum for me to grab and show you. We can make a four wall habitat here. So we'll put it right like this. So we can click once to build it and click again to confirm and you can kind of change the height of it here. We go like this. Now we've got a building, right, with no doors on it. So what you can do at this point is add a door so that you can get in your newly created building. And we'll go like this and we can attach it right here. And now we have a building, we have an airlock, and we can put stuff in here. You can put crafting stations, research benches, you know, uh, whatever you want to have at your little outpost. You can put these workbenches here. Um, another thing that you can do is put turrets around your base in case it's attacked, especially if you put... It's very possible that your base could be attacked. So, you know, not a bad idea to have some turret defenses. Now, if we look at this, it says power costs three. It's grayed out. So we don't have the power for it right now. We need power. So let's go ahead and make another power source, shall we? And one thing that you can do if you want like an easier view is from here, you can hit view mode down there. It says hit V for view mode and you can kind of do a bird's eye view of your place while you're building in it. So from here we can say mm, we needed more power. So let's find the power again and let's make another one of these. There we go. Now this guy has power operating cost three power and he is powered, right? So you could do that. There's multiple types of power that you can make. You have the solar array, which makes six power. You You've got a wind turbine, which you can make using different materials, which will give you three per. You've got the fueled generator, which is going to give you a whopping 20 power. Looks like it needs some tungsten, which I don't happen to have with me right now. I think I stored that somewhere else. So a few different types of power, each with their own uh, costs associated with them, depending on what you have, you might lean to one or the other. Now our water pump has been hard at work here, pumping, pumping, pumping. So we can take that water. We can take that and we could say inventory. And we could store all of our water. And it says it's at 7% capacity with 10 water in it. This thing will keep making water and you can keep adding it to there if you don't want to hold it on you. So if you're doing some crafting in this area and you need water or, you know, whatever it is you're pulling out of the ground, it could be aluminum, it could be water, you know, it could be nice to have these storage containers to kind of keep your character from having to find a place to put it or having to carry it around on your ship. Um, if you know you're going to be digging up a lot of it.
So that's what the water storage is for. If you want to be able to transfer items from your outpost to your ship, you know, without having to do it manually, you can use a transfer container. You can build one of these, set it down, and this thing will basically allow you to be in your ship and just kind of grab items from here and vice versa. In order to be able to build more outposts, there's a couple things that you can do. So you've got outpost engineering here and at rank one, you can construct improved outposts, modules, and research additional modules at a research lab at rank rank two, you can research and construct superior outpost modules. At rank three, you can research and construct cutting edge outpost modules. And then at rank four, outpost modules now cost 50% fewer resources to build. This is going to allow you to build your outposts in less and less mm, friendly habitats and biomes and things like that. Sometimes you get on a planet and the weather is particularly unfriendly. This is what's going to let you know how to make an outpost in that on that planet. So if you ever run into a situation where you try to make an outpost and you can't, it's probably because you don't have the materials to create the outpost or you don't have the outpost engineering level to make the outpost in that place. The game will generally tell you which one you're missing, although um, I think I've seen situations where I try to build the outpost and it just doesn't tell me. So when you're setting up your outpost, it could be a good idea to go into this view so you can see exactly what the radius of your outpost is going to be able to be. See that yellow circle there. Another really useful one to know about is the cargo link. Build these in two different outposts and link them together to allow transfer of goods between them. Items in outgoing container will be transported to the incoming container and the other outposts and vice versa. Link outposts within the same system, no fuel required. So just a nice little thing that you can do to link two different outposts together so each of them have access to the other's resources. But do note that it does say a link outpost within the same system. So you can't have two outposts in two different solar systems linked together that way. You can even build your own landing pad if you want to. If you build the larger of the two, it allows you to land directly at your outposts and lets you modify your ship and even buy new ones from this. Pretty cool. You can put down a mission board at your outpost. And this one's pretty useful. Self-service bounty clearance. You can clear your bounty with one of these. And I have been in situations where this would have been very helpful to have because I had a bounty and I didn't have an easy or safe way to clear it. You know, being able to go out to an outpost and just just knock it out before I ran into the lot would have been nice. As far as defenses go, you know, I touched on it briefly, but just realize and remember that they gave you defenses. So there's probably a reason that they let you build turrets, right? So definitely don't leave yourself completely undefended. Uh, there's furniture that you can do for mostly RP, you know, if you just want to make your place look nice inside. Decorations, same thing, but there's some functionality here as well with the storage boxes and the storage crates. You've got mannequins that you can put in there, which will hold the gear. You can put a helmet, a space suit, and a jetpack on a mannequin. You can plant down a scan booster. This is going to double the range of your hand scanner in that region. You can also build crew stations. So there's going to be NPCs that you find, crewmates, that you can either put on your ship or you can assign to outposts. And so if you assign them to an outpost or if you want to assign them to an outpost, you'd want to make one of these. And doing so, it says build this to allow crew to be assigned to your outpost. The outpost management skill will let you build more crew stations at each of your outposts. So by doing this, you can put a crew member here that specializes in whatever you are doing at that outpost. If you were mining ore or like metals or inorganic resources, as it calls them, right, you might want to put a NPC or a crew member there that specializes in that. So outposts can be a great way to passively gather the materials you know you're going to need a lot of, like aluminum. You know, this is a great place to basically have an aluminum factory since we know we're going to need a lot of aluminum to make uh, future outposts as well as to expand this one. So that ramps up outpost building. What about ship building? I'm glad you asked. Okay, so you're going to talk to a guy like this guy here. He's got a few different options and there's one of these next to every major landing pad. He'll either repair your ship for 1000 credits, which generally you're going to want to do if it's taken damage. You don't want to use your repair kits for your ship because those are a lot harder to come by than this guy is. You can also tell him that you'd like to view and modify your ships. You can say, let me see what ships you have for sale. And where did you say I could sell things? He's going to tell you that little machine we were standing next to. But let's first look at what he has for sale. So we can look at the ships he has for sale here and we can see the price down here, value 56,000 and their mass. But we'd probably want to know things like the cargo capacity. How much does it hold? You know, we probably want something that holds a lot or you might want something that has a lot of space for the crew 
members you want to bring around the game with you. Maybe you want to have good shields, right? This is a jalopy. We don't want this, right? This one's a little better. It's got an A-class reactor. It's got 30 light year travel distance, but that's because its cargo capacity is only 260. I mean, you can you can basically carry a few paper clips with you and then this thing's full, right? That kind of sucks. Then there's this bad boy right here, the Galileo, which kind of looks a little bit like my ship. This thing can only hold 200, 25 light year, four crew members. Eh. Let's find a big boy. Ah, uh, here we go. Look at this thing. So the dragon fire. This is a ship I would like to have. It can hold seven crew members. It can jump 25 light years. It's got a nice beefy 680 shield. It's going to cost me 300,000 credits, which is kind of a lot. I'm 40 hours in the game. I've been picking up like just about everything and selling just about as much as I can. And I'm at about 412,000. Now, if I had fixated on making currency and generating currency and um, selling more stuff to more vendors, then we could probably easily have more than this but you know 40 40 hours in 400,000 it's not a bad expectation if you're fairly thorough so you know this is not a cheap ship it's rather quite expensive at 300,000 but it's coming with a lot right the only downside is that it is a sea reactor here and always save before you buy a ship if you want a ship make sure to save before you buy it that way if you buy it and you can't fly it you can load your previous save or if you buy it and it's not what you wanted or you don't like it or something like that make sure you save before you make a big purchase like this. That way you can undo it real easily if you kind of have buyer's remorse after the fact. This is a fantastic ship though, cargo capacity wise. It's got 2,790 cargo capacity. That's massive. It's got tons of fuel. Uh, it's, you know, got tons of HP, 800 there. It's nice. This is a solid ship really well all around. I wouldn't mind flying this bad boy. So what you would do then is you could purchase it. Now, if I purchase the ship, I don't have the ability to fly it. And this kind of goes back to what I said earlier about if I was to start over and I'm going to start over again as soon as the game launches. Uh, one of the things I'm going to prioritize is piloting. You know, this is probably my biggest mistake was not leveling this up. So I didn't have points into piloting. And so I was killing tons of ships, but it didn't count because I didn't have it unlocked. And so now I need ships to kill and I'm just not running into them. I've got to I've got to go out and hunt some ships down to kill so I can get these level unlocked so I can unlock the ability to pilot E class and C class ships. Do you see there? It says B and unlock the ability to pilot C. So I need two more levels to fly this big boy right here, which is a mistake I made that I fortunately get to warn you not to make. So if you think you're going to be excited about flying the biggest and the baddest ships, level up your piloting every chance you get. Make sure you uh, can continue to level it up and make sure that when you're killing other ships, you're pushing the progress along on that challenge that you need to complete the next level. So if we look at the ships that are for sale again, you can see right here, A, right? We can do A. We could do this A. We could do this A. And this one, this one too, this one still, right? We could fly all of those, but then boom, this one says C. We do not have the ability to fly the C. So definitely check what grade that ship is. It is a C grade, is it an A grade, a B grade, right? And know that you need to be rank three of the skill or beyond to fly B and below. And you need to be rank four to fly C grade and below. So level up your piloting one. Don't make the mistake I did on this first playthrough. Level up your piloting. Okay, so that's how you can buy ships. And every place you go and try to buy a ship, they have different ships in their inventory. So if you don't like the ships that this guy has for sale, you could check the guy at another landing port in another major city. Uh, you could steal ships. The way I got the ship that I'm flying around, I actually saw a ship land on a planet. So if you go onto a moon or a planet and you just start running away from civilization, sometimes you'll trigger an encounter where a spaceship comes and it lands out in the desert or out in the wilderness, right? And you just run, 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 hoof it all the way over to that ship where it landed and you can sometimes sneak onto the ship and kill whoever's on board and take it for yourself. And that's nice. When you do that, you can keep it or you can come to this guy or one of these guys and you can sell it. In order to sell the ship, you have to register the ship. So it's the game's way of giving you something that sells for like, let's say 13 to 40,000 gold without giving you 13 to 40,000 gold after you register it, right? Like let's say you found a $40,000 ship. The registration fee for that ship would be like 38,000 credits, right? So your profit on the ship isn't gonna be 40 grand. It's going to be two grand, right? And that's kind of how they stop you from just making absurd amounts of money by stealing ships. 
ships out in the wilderness because you got to register them first. Another problem you might have when you go to steal one of those ships is you'll kill everybody on board and then you'll get up to the pilot's chair and you'll try to sit in it and it'll be like, yeah, nice try. You don't have the ability to fly the ship. And that goes back to this haunting decision I made right here, not to start leveling this up right away. I totally misunderstood how it worked when I first started this character. So don't make the mistake I did because there's nothing worse than finding a really cool ship and not being able to fly away with it. Okay, so that covers buying the ship, selling the ship, finding ships out in the wild. Now, what if you want to build your own ship or modify? So I'd like to view and modify my ships. So we talked to him. He says, sure, man, yeah, go for it. So the thing that you have to notice is, let's say a really common one is going to be, you want to add more cargo space. Adding cargo space to your ship is really inexpensive. So it's not a bad idea to do it. Even if you feel like, you know, this isn't the ship I want to take home to mom and dad. This is the ship I just want to have a fun time with for a short time, right? You know, it's that it's that temporary ship that you just, it's, it's until you find something better, right? So we're down here, we're going to go into ship builder mode and we're going to click add and now we can tell that what we want to add so one of the things that you can do is before you push the button add hover over the thing you want to add it to so let's say i wanted to add some cargo space um it's going to try to put it wherever i'm hovering over so see how this one's lit up it's going to try to put the cargo space there now there's a lot of reasons why something will or won't fit somewhere when you try to do it and the honest answer is you're going to learn by trial and error a lot right now my ship has one warning a warning is okay warning we can check the flight the flight check here so we press that and it says low mobility reduce mass or add engines to improve mobility so if i'm in combat and i'm flying Flying around. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to go very fast because my thrust to weight ratio is pretty awful on this ship right now. I'm totally okay with that because I'm okay with moving a little slower in battle to be able to carry tons of loot around with me as I go. As an example of one of the really common problems that you'll run into while trying to build your ship is your docking module. This is the docking module. So when I want to attach to a space station or to another ship, this needs to be like on the outer edge of the ship, right? This needs to be able to connect to the dock without the rest of my ship getting in the way. So it always has to be like the highest portion of the ship or the farthest back, right? It needs to be on some exterior edge that won't run into conflict. So right now it's at this elevation right here which is technically, uh, apparently, it's technically just fine, right? This thing is a little higher, but it, the station reaches out and links with it, so it's okay. If I move this up here, let's see, right there on top of that, now we have an error. See, we have a problem here. If we click flight check, it says invalid Docker module position. Docker module needs to be on an outside edge of the ship, right? So that is not going to work. So we're going to go ahead and put that back. Okay, that's wrong. So the ship can fly, you can build it and have a warning. But if it has an error, it won't let you finish the construction of the ship because it's just not going to work. Okay, so back to adding storage. That all circles back. So where can we add storage now? Let's say we move the docking module up here so it's on the highest point on the ship so that that's not a problem anymore. And it looks like it has no problem with that. Great. Now let's add cargo. So you'll notice here the cargo kind of has to be attached to like a structure. You can't just attach cargo to like the wing or something like that. We need some structural point for it to attach to. So let's add a structure here. Let's go with like a hab like this here. Put a nice big one. Okay. Okay. Now we've got that there. And now we can add to that cargo, right? This is going to be a really popular thing to want to add. Boom. Look, now we have three stacks of cargo over there. And if we hover over this side, click add, click accept. Now we got more cargo. So the one thing that's happening is our mass is going up and our mobility and our jump range will eventually go down. So we might have had 22 jump range before, but since we keep adding weight to the ship, it's not going to travel quite as far now. That's the one downside. But my cargo capacity is going through the roof, right? Now we can hold 3,400 cargo capacity. So we can hold tons of resources if we just went and farmed a ton of aluminum, a ton of water, a ton of anything at all, right? Weapons, gear, stuff we want to sell. We can put that in here, right? We got tons of cargo. Now, if you wanted to be able to get your grav jump range back up again, you'd have to put a better grav drive in, right? So we delete this grav drive and we add a new one. Okay, it looks like if we put this one here, we'll get to 25. Boom. So now we can jump 25 light years, but we've got an error here. And this is what's going to happen. You'll 
add something, it'll create an error. And then you got to solve the thing that it, the error that it created. And the error is usually, depending on the thing, the error might be that it's just in a place that, you know, ruins the ship's ability to dock. Or it might be something like, okay, that's fine. But in order to have that grab drive, you need a better power supply. And so we might have to replace our reactor. So let's check ship contain modules that exceed the reactor class. So we do, we need a better reactor. So we delete that reactor because you can only have one grab drive. You can only have one reactor. So let's try to put a better reactor on here. Okay, go. And here we got reactors. And my problem here is I can't build the ship the way that I'm building it right now because I don't have the uh, I don't have the capability to use the better reactor. The ability to use better reactors is going to come from my skills. So the biggest takeaway from the shipbuilding process is, yeah, it's going to take a second to get used to kind of handling this and figuring out what you can put where. But also, I want to impress upon you how important it is to have the associated perks, because right now I can't put the reactor because I don't have the perk, right? It needs me to have Starship Design Rank 2 in order to put this reactor here. And I don't have Starship Design Rank 2. So if you want to create really cool spaceships and fly really cool spaceships, you're going to need to have your piloting leveled up. You're going to need starship design to allow for the installation of improved ship modules, superior ship modules, cutting edge ship modules and experimental ones, right? So if you want to get into that, flying a spaceship and making a really cool spaceship and, you know, definitely then grab piloting, grab starship design, right? And make sure you're working on that. Also, if you want to be making your own really cool spaceships, you're going to want to work your way down this tree and get this starship design. When you're trying to add items and if you're wondering why something's grayed out, just look over here on the left and you'll see piloting rank three, starship design rank four before you can start slotting these kinds of things onto your ship. Now, one really cool thing that you can do that it took me way too long to figure out is you can simply double click on the ship anywhere and it's going to select every piece of the ship all at once this is incredibly useful for changing the color of your ship otherwise you'd have to do one piece at a time and eventually you're going to have a lot of pieces on there so you can come in here and you can change the color of the ship to whatever you want here and so we can do that for all three of the colors let's see there we go. And now the whole ship here is like a teal color. Very easy to do all at once. If you don't want to build your ship, let's say you like the ship you have well enough and you're not looking to build and you're afraid of building, you're just not ready to take that leap into all of the complications that may or may not arise from that while you're trying to do it, then you could do upgrade ship and you can select individual pieces of the ship. So you've got weapon zero, weapon one, weapon two, engines, and then also you can go to shields, grab drives, reactors, right? So rather than trying to go into the build creator, you can just right here kind of cycle through everything and just upgrade the piece you want to upgrade. Like if you want to squeeze out a little more room on the grab drive, you can see like what's available. It looks like if I put this grab drive, my range actually goes down to 19. So not much of an upgrade available uh, for the reactor. If I hover over these, the first two, you see I'm losing power. The three red bars on the left, it says it's going down, down to 14, down to 16. This one would take me up to 20. So I could use this and slap that on there. And it's not showing me the things I can't use right now, which is nice. So now we can look at the grab drives and it's only that same downgrade available. So it looks like we're as good as we're going to get on the grab drive on this bad boy right now with my skills where they're at on this playthrough. I think one of the most interesting things that's going to come from this game is all of the crazy ship designs that people come up with, you know, just how ridiculous they are, how cool they are and everything in between. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys do with this game's ship design process. It's really, really cool what they've done with it, isn't it? Okay, other cool things to know are that you can sit in a chair and I'm sitting in the chair, like we mentioned at the beginning of the video, you can wait. If you wait, all it does is let time pass, which is fine. That can be nice for some missions, but you'll see that my health is missing some health there, the health bar. So if we sleep for one hour, sleep, a couple things happen. One, now my health bar is full. So it gives you all your health back. Also, it puts the rested status on you. So if we look at our character and we look at our statuses, we are well rested, which means we're going to get 10% bonus XP. Really cool thing. The game doesn't tell you at all. You just 
just kind of notice it when you're poking around after you rest one time. And I think a lot of people are going to miss that. So take advantage of that extra 10% XP. Remember, leveling faster is pretty huge because that's going to give you more of these points to spend every time you level. And these things are pretty critical. As we discussed, you can't open certain things if you don't have security done. You can't fly certain spaceships if you don't have your piloting leveled up enough or starship design. You can't build the cool ships, right? Some of these you're really going to want to have unlocked. I mean, actually, there's a lot of these you're going to really want to have unlocked, but some are critical. So getting as many points as you can as soon as possible is going to help having those extra levels, you know, from that extra 10%. A couple more things that are really handy to know. So if you have your weapon out and you want to put it away, hold down your reload button. So on PC, you would just hold down R and it would put it away. If you are in a dark space and you want to pull out your flashlight, just hold down your scanner button. So on PC, that is F. So we just hold down F and there's the flashlight. Hold it down again and it goes away. Tap it, it brings out a scanner. Hold it down. It turns on the flashlight, right? So there's a couple of buttons that have two functions. That is going to be your reload and your scanner. Those kind of have dual functionality. So if you hold down reload, it brings out the weapon and hold it down. It puts it away. Scanner is the flashlight, right? If you hold that button down. So that's kind of an easy one to miss. Even though the game tells you how to pull out your flashlight in like the first 30 seconds, I made it like 30 hours into the game, not knowing that it was a thing. <laughs> because I never tried holding down F and I was so enamored with the beginning of the game that I missed the little tip that pops up in the first 30 seconds telling me how to do it. I didn't even see that tip until I started recording this video for you guys here today. I went through the beginning of the game to get to the character creator and saw that if you hold it down, it pops up right on screen. I was like, oh my gosh, man, it was right there all along. Go figure. All right, if you are still watching this video, I hope that one, you enjoyed it. I hope that two, it was informative and I hope you guys have as much fun with this game as I have been having with it as always if you made it to the end of this beginner guide you're an absolute legend be sure to leave a comment down below letting me know that you made it and thank you so much for watching i hope you enjoyed watching the video as much as i enjoyed making it and i hope you enjoy starfield as much as i have massive shout out to my youtube members if you want to become a member of this youtube channel for behind the scenes footage private discord channel access having your name show up at the end of every video and more be sure to click the join button down below thanks so much for watching and be sure to subscribe for more amazing starfield coverage until next video.